It's Mark in the 11th chapter, verses 15 through 18. And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast them out that sold and bought in the temple. And over through the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And would not su suffer any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying to them, It is not written, My house shall be called, a, called of all nations at the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again, that as we, we have come gathered here in your house today, Lord, we've come not only to honor you with our praises, Lord, but to thank you again for your goodness, that you, what you have provided and given to us. But Lord, also as we come and allow you to minister into our hearts, Lord, as we read your word today, Lord, we pray that you would stir us in a special way. Lord, that you would give us new, new desires to draw closer to you, Lord, that we would take your word and bury it deep into our hearts. We pray your blessings on your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. As we read these scriptures today, you know, this may be something that may be very familiar to most of you. Three different times we find out through God's word that, uh, that Jesus had, went into the temple and he had to make changes, didn't he? He had, to t he had to make them realize that what they were doing was not correct. If you look in John in the second chapter, verse 13, we find that he did, had done this. If we look at Matthew in the 21st chapter, verses 12 through, I think, 13 or 15, that we find that also that he had done that. It talks about he made a small cord and he overthrew the money changers and he cast them out of the temple. And today as we read this in Mark, we find that this was the exact same thing that Jesus had to do here. He found that the people hearts were not right and, and sin had entered in and they were taking advantage of what was supposed to be something good and was not. If we look at scripture we find that as Jesus just came through Jerusalem and the first place that he wanted to go was to the temple. He could have went anywhere. He could have took time to rest up from his journey. He could have went and presented himself as most kings would have done if they were if a, a, an earthly king. They would have went to the palace. They would have went to a place and to, 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 do, to begin to do the affairs of things that they needed to do. But Jesus went to the temple because he knew what was important and he wanted to take care of the spiritual things that needed to be done at that time. But as he got there, we think as we look at a temple, when he said the Bible talks about him going to a temple, we think of our building like we have, a, a place, a building, a place to worship. But in biblical times, a temple was more than just one building. It was several buildings. It had courtyards. Because if you look at in Scripture, it was a place where they sold animals, where they kept animals, and they also there was other things that was taking place as far as like money being exchanged and so forth. And the purpose of this money being exchanged was that when they, Roman citizens would come, they'd have to exchange the Roman currency over for the temple coinage or the things that they, the money that they used there in the temple. But also it, it, through the through the process, it, they, they also had livestock there or animals to be sacrificed so people that didn't have any could come and purchase them and so on. Also, but as we look through many good things that God has provided throughout our, our nation and our world and down through the history, we find that sin always seems to find a way to enter into people's hearts and drive a wedge there. People would have to bring their sacrifices because according to God's word, it was supposed to be perfect without blemish. So they would bring them and they'd have people inspect them there and they would say, well, yours isn't, yours is, there isn't perfect. Yours isn't the quality that we are looking for. So they just happened to have some of them around. And they would just ha was happy to provide that service for them at a cost. And you, as you begin to see what was beginning to take place, it became to become a place where they could make money off people that, uh, and take advantage of, of the thing, situation that they was in because it was required that they did this. And they, they'd have to go back and get their money exchanged so they could buy, and they would take advantage of him there. And after a while, it, the, a, sin begin, a sin enters in the way it does all the time, slowly and steadily begins to drive a wedge between people and God. This is what was taking place here. And when Jesus got there, he seen that. And he, saw, he, he, he told him, you know, this, my place is, in so many words, is supposed to be a place, a house of prayer. And that's what it was. It was supposed to be holy and sacred. The same as our sanctuary today is, is a sacred and a holy place as we gather to do, to do things, this, to worship God this morning. You know, the, thing, the bad thing wasn't what was taking place there. 
the idea of, of, of exchanging the money so they could buy the, the, the sacrifices, they that was okay, but it was the way that it was being done. It was intended for God for those to be able to do that, but it was not intended for man to take advantage of that and, and to make money after it. And after a while, if you realize, can you imagine what kind of chaos that would have been? They would have made it just like a regular store. You could come, you could buy your animal, you, we would exchange your money, we would make money, and you could go do what you wanted to do. And after a while, they lost the, the reason why they came. People were taking so much advantage of other people, and soon it became just like an ordinary flea market to them, buying and so on, and, uh, and not truly having the heart for the Lord that, that, we, that they needed to have. And I look back today and I say, how does this compare to us? How does this compare to us today in our society? And oftentimes I look back and I think, well, Satan continually to find, find ways to stop people from coming to God's house. Stop people from do worshiping God the way that they should. You know, if, if, you're, if, you, uh, if you smash your finger, if you take your hammer, a, a hammer, and you smash your finger, hopefully not purposely, but if you would, if you, or if you've ever smashed your finger, doesn't it not take everything else away off your mind? You're focused upon only that hurt that you received. And you, you really don't care about anything else. You're not really, you really don't care if the cat needs, dog needs to go outside or, you know, all these other things. All you're worried about is the pain that you're experiencing from your thumb or whatever it is that you may have smashed. And oftentimes, I believe Satan does that to us as people. If he can just get our mind off the things that we should be focused upon as God's people. If he can cause havoc within our lives and allow us to be drawn away from where we should be as God's people, he, he'll try to do that. And if we're focused on other things, and if it's, if, if it's affecting us in such a way that we're not focusing on other things, then it's so easy for him to guide us away from not living the life that we should as God's people. And much, I believe this is much what was taking place here today. They were being driven away. They were enjoying the worldly things of life and, and not honoring God the way that God intended for it to be honored. You know, I often think of, you know, have, as I look at that story, I think of well, how, how today in our own society people like to take advantage of other people, take good things and make bad things out of, out of them in our society today. As we look at there, as we talk about the services that they were to offer, have you ever, ever gone to uh, the mall before and then you, you go to maybe Walmart or another department store, whatever it may be, and you find the very exact same item and you realize that you just paid like 20 times the amount up there what you could have paid at, the one, at another store? And that was much like what was taking place here today in this, in this, as the people were exchanging things in the temple. The secondly, there were the, the temple, yeah, as we said, was they were, they were taking advantage of people's money, exchanging that as well. In a, sen in a sense, the temple, as I said before, came nothing more than just a flea market. But that's that's a, a lot what was taking place there. You know, God's house was intended for a place to be to pr to come to pray and to worship Him. God said, God God created a sanctuary, a place that where people could gather to honor Him, to worship Him and for it to be sacred and holy. And I look at our, across their nation and the world, and you see different churches and things that take place, and I wonder, where is that sacredness gone? Where is that holiness to God gone in, in, in us today, even as Christians? Somewhere along the line, we seem to have been losing out on that, how important it is to present ourselves before God. How important it is for the God, that we come to God's house prepared to worship him, prepared to, to, to honor him and to give him the credit that is due to his name and to realize that his place is a place of holiness. You know, when Jesus entered into the, as I said, he went directly to the temple. Could you imagine what he felt when he walked into that place? Seriously, when he walked into the temple, which he expected, he already knew, but he expected it to be a place of holiness. He expected to be a place of honor, a place where people had gathered to come and to, to not only to ask for forgiveness of their sins, but a place where they could come learn about the word, God's word, where they could come and they could feel the Holy Spirit move in their lives, where they could come and get in tune with God and realize when he walked into that place and as he knew the hearts of the people and he began to see how far away they was in their walk, relationship with God. It's amazing. Sometimes I think we forget that God knows our hearts. 
You know, you can put, you can, you can put, make something look very good on the outside. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've seen people cook things, hams and turkeys that look really good on the outside. They're nice and golden brown. You cut them open, they're not done. They're not inside, they're, they're, maybe they're too done. But it's amazing how well you can address something on the outside and make it look so well. But with the inside, it's not the way that it should be. And uh, I think many Christians are like that today. I think many people are like that today. That God knows the hearts of people. And uh, I think sometimes as people we think, well, I can get it. I'll look good on the outside. They'll never know the difference of what I do at my house. They'll never know the difference of things I was involved with in this week. They'll never know the things that goes through my mind. But you know, it doesn't matter about people, does it? It matters what God thinks and, the, and, and what is going on. And I can imagine Jesus as he walked in, how disappointed he was. And why he would want to run these people out of his own temple, a place of worship. Why would he, and why he did it? Because it needed to be done. And no one else was taking a stand and doing it. And today I wonder, you know, if, if God would look at our lives and our church, what are we truly taking a stand for as people? What are the things are we allowing in our own church or our churches around our nation or around our world? What things are we allowing to come in? How much have we have watered down things throughout the generations? Uh, we were sitting this morning talk, eating breakfast, and we were talking about some of the, the cereals that we, me and Caitlin's mom used to have, and compared to all the different things that you go in the store now, and you see all the variety down through the thing. We were talking about like having oatmeal, cream of wheats, and I don't know, something else. I don't remember what it was now, cocoa puffs or something. I don't remember. But now you go, and there's 50 different varieties. And she said, uh, well, didn't you have those things? <laughs> And uh, Elaine said well, it was a different world then, a different society, a different culture, not only just for food, but, you know, culture in general. And it's the true. Things are changing. Things, are, and even as our culture and the, as the generations go by, things are definitely changing. Things that were held once important or once that were held sacred to God are now just watered down and it's just something that you do. It's, be, it's something that you go and do. It's, you go to church because that's, you just do that on Sunday. There seems to be no purpose to it. The people today seem to not know why we gather in God's house. Why it is so important that we have a relationship with God. Why it's important that we come to church and we, we set up straight and we, we, we hold the God's sanctuary as a sacred and holy place. Why we shouldn't talk or goof off and all these other things that some people seem to like to do while they gather in God's house is a place of worship. It's a place where we come to get, get a hold of the Lord and to honor Him in everything that we do in life. You know, God, it was God's intent for, for us to be as people, to be a set apart from the world, to be different. Some people don't like to be different. Some people don't like to stand out in the crowd. Some people just, don't, just can't take that very well. Some people don't like to get up front because they're afraid what other people may think. Some people don't just just are not so confident in their own ability to do it, even though they can do it. But today in our world, it seems like people don't want to take a stand, especially as God, and I really don't understand that. If you look at other organizations and other things that people stand for, they're not afraid to get up and say, this is who I am, this is what I do, even if it's against God's word. But where, where are God's people? Where are the God's people he is called to stand up and to fight against all these different things that's happening in our world and our society today? As we look at Jesus, he wasn't afraid to stand in the temple. He wasn't afraid to stand up against what was taking place and what was wrong in his own house. But yet he did that. Jesus says, written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. We too, you know, so often, you know, we may not be in this exact situation. We may not be selling our cows or things like that, but we still need to take heed to these words. We need to take heed to these words in our lives that we are still honoring God. The temple was a place where God could go and dwell. A, place, a temple was a place where the Holy Spirit can move and things can take place and, and touch people's lives. And you realize that this sanctuary, which is, is beautiful, provided to us by God, is, is beautiful, but this is not the church. We are the church. Each and every person here makes up the church. Each and every person here is a temple before the Lord. 
Each and every person here has a responsibility to keep themselves prepared because God wants to dwell within you. We are God's dwelling place. We are what what we are a place that God can come and dwell within us. And other people may see that God lives within us. As we gather in God's house, a place that we gather in, a sanctuary, a temple, a place that we come this morning to a church, a place that we come to worship. It's when God's people come together and God dwells with him that we can come together and honor him because of what he has done for us in our lives. You know, think about this for a minute. If God is not living within you, you you have to be honest with yourself. If God is not truly dwelling within your life, you may come to church on Sunday. You may, you may look fine on the outside you may, uh, and make a good appearance of the things that you do. But if God is not truly dwelling within you, that you are not presentable as a temple before the Lord, that God cannot find a place to dwell within you, when you come to God's house, how do we expect to receive a blessing from the Lord? How do we expect to receive what God wants to do if God does not even dwell within us? As a temple. As we gather in God's house, when God, you know, you can come and you can praise and worship God all that you want to. But if He's not living within you, if you have if you have, if you have stepped away from the God and He's not really dwelling within you, then how can you experience the God at His best and His greatest? When we gather to worship in God's house, if God's not dwelling within you, if God is if if, if you're not a place where God can reside within yourself. You're not feeling God's Holy Spirit. You're not living a life that would be pleasing to God or you have stepped away and you've grown cold in the Lord. How can you expect to come to church and to receive a blessing from the Lord if you're not even walking with Him? You know, when God shows up, as Jesus did here in the temple, I kind of like, you know, He came to church, didn't He? Jesus came to the temple. He came to see, to worship, to honor His Father. To witness and to teach other people about his word and the promises and why they'll give him hope of life. Why he came to us. The same thing he gives to us, each and every one of us in this world. To give us hope and and he comes to us to change our lives, to transform us. To give us, to to allow us to receive what he has to offer. To give us the promises that we can cling on to and have faith in him. If we don't have that, how are we going to receive a blessing from the Lord? When God dwells within us and we have a close relationship with him and we come to God's house and we come to worship him, we come to get a hold of the Lord, we come to seek after him and to hear his word, allow it to minister into our lives, what a difference there is. What a difference it is when God, we, when God truly comes to a house of worship within us and we come seeking and preparing. It's not a place that we gather. It's not a place that we just gather because it's Sunday and our friends are there. And this is what we do. And I, I can say, oh, I went to church and feel all good about what we do. So many times that we water down things in life. We, we water down our Christianity. We accept things that maybe we shouldn't accept. Because over time it seems like we have walked farther and farther away from God. They say that if the Holy Spirit was taken out of this world today, that 90% of the churches wouldn't even know the difference. Ninety percent, that's what they're saying, would not even know the difference that the Holy Spirit did not dwell within this world. Because people are walking farther and farther away from God. Let me ask you this morning, if Jesus would walk in, as as the scripture says, he went to the temple. If Jesus would come into this door today, right now, what what would you feel? Think about it. Maybe you would feel a peace. Maybe you would feel a love or a calm over you. Maybe you would feel excitement. Would you sit up straighter in your seats? Would you put your phones away? Would you honor him? Would you actually truly worship him? The way that the God's word tells us that we are to worship him. What would you do different? Would you pay closer attention? Think about that for a minute. What would you do? 
Because each Sunday we gather in God's house around this world and around, around our nation and, and even in our own sanctuary, we come to worship our Lord and our Savior because He's real. For what He has done to us. For the gift of eternal life that He has given to us. Where so many times even our side we fall lax, get laxed in our things that we do in life. We get laxed in everyday things we do at home, when we know the things that we need to accomplish. How much more do we get laxed in our spiritual walk with God? How much more do we allow, allow our spiritual walk with God to be second in our lives? And the world, the things that we put first in, is the things of the world. Thinking that these things are more important when the thing, our heavenly things and spiritual things are much, much more important. In Ephesians 2, 19-22, it says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people, members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as a chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his Spirit. God is our chief cornerstone. He is the one that we build upon. And we are God's dwelling place. Ask yourselves today. Be honest, please. Am I prepared? Would God be pleased with me as a dwelling place? Does God dwell within me the way that God wants to dwell within me? Am I living a life that is pleasing to God? And everything that I do, the things I did this last week, everything I thought, said, and did, would it be pleasing to God? We all have times in our life, even especially as Christians, that we fall short of God's glory. That's, the Bible tells us we will. But we can strive to be draw closer to God. We can still strive to be living a life that would be pleasing to God so that God can dwell with, uh, with us. As Jesus walked into the temple and he saw what was taking place that day, he saw all the, how he knew the hearts of the people and how far they were away from having a spiritual relationship with him. What would he find within you today? Something that maybe you've heard lots of times, but it's so important. What would God find within your life today, your spiritual walk with him? Well, how would he, how would he look at you? Would he be able to say, there is a place that I can dwell? There's a place that I can, I can feel comfortable in. There's a person who loves me. There's a person who is trying so hard to have the faith and to trust in him, believes in my every word that I have given to them. What would he find today? If we look at the, world, at the word church, as we gather this morning, it really means a calling out. We are called out from everything around us. We are called out from our arguments and our squabbling. We are called out from our pride and our, from our ambitions. Together we, we are the church and we are called to a higher purpose. Each and every one of us have been called to a higher purpose with the Lord. God has a special plan for all of us. So many times I think we, we put ourselves down when God says, you, you're, you're supposed to be up here. This is where I want you to be. This is where I, 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 I have a plan for you. I have something special for you to do. You know, we're supposed to be different. We're not supposed to be tied and mingled up with the things of the world, blended, so to speak. Have you ever heard that, blended? So many people and so many people try to blend with the world and with God. They try to smooth it out. They think, wow, I'm doing good. I've handled, I'm doing everything I need to do in this side, and I'm doing everything that I think I need to do for God. And I'm in the middle, and I'm, I've got everything blended out, and everything's doing good. God didn't ask for us to be blended together, did he? He told us to be set apart. That, he, that we are to be different. That we are not to be a part of the things of this world, but we are to be on fire for the Lord and to show the world what is important and what is right. As we look at the sinful nature of man in God's word here today, but how many churches around the world in this very nation have fallen away from God? Really, think about it. How many people have truly fallen away from God? I can tell you a lot. If not, our sanctuary would be full today. I could tell you a lot because people are not here in God's house to worship him. Then you have an understanding that where are the people going? Why is it that they do not want to accept the, Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? 
a lot of the times we are known by our fruits and the things that we do as God's people. Allowing and accepting things in, their li- in our lives, rationalizing what is it that sets Christians apart from non-believers. So many times we, we rationalize things. And I said last week, I think you could talk yourself into anything. I believe it's true. Ever try that before? Continue, if you continue to tell you something that you're okay or that your life or everything that you're doing is okay, if you do it long enough, I do believe that you can talk yourself into thinking it. If you do it long enough. So you say, oh, that's not possible. It happens day after day after day. Everyone, I'm a, my life, I'm, I'm, I'm a good person. I'm not going to church, but I'm doing good. I'm helping my neighbors. I'm doing this. God would be pleased with me for the way that I live my life. I'm okay. Day after day, people believe that and think that. And maybe after a while, they think, there's no way that I would not go to heaven. That God would be pleased with me everything I do. And I think sometimes, even as Christians, how we begin to, to water down God's word. We begin to water down what's important. What's, we begin to believe everything what we're doing is okay. And as you begin to read God's word, you find out quickly that things that we think are okay are not. How often have we made excuses, reasoning for not being in God's house? Today in the journey with God, have you been faithful to God? Have you been? Faithful and true to our living God. Have you honored God with your substance? Have you honored God with your your prayers? Have you honored God with your worship? Have you honored God with your service unto him? It seems today that our churches, as I said before, has just been a place that we gather. A social time. A time where we gather to just find out what our so-and-so is doing next week or has done this week or... What's going on in somebody else's life? When it's not about that, it's about coming and worshiping God with everything that we have. It means that we are to live our lives focused. Be mindful that you are in, you are God's dwelling place. Sometimes I think we forget that. I was created for God to dwell within me. I was created for a higher purpose than the things that I'm doing, trying to strive for in this life trying to make a living, trying to just earn money for my family, to go on vacations, to buy things of the earth. That's not what God's plan was for us. He called us, he gave us the things that we could survive, but our higher calling is serving him with our lives and allowing him, giving him a place that he, he can dwell in. As I said before, Jesus knew that things needed to be changed as he went to the temple. Sometimes it's hard to to think that we need change. Sometimes we get stuck down in the rut every day. And sometimes we, th- we, we fail to realize that things, things need change in our lives. You know, sometimes even in our own homes, it's time to be updated, isn't it? Have you ever, I can remember going to, and that's kind of what made grandmother's house so special. You go there and it was old. And as kids, we thought our grandparents was old too. But, but you know, when you went there, they had everything. They had things that were old. But, but that's because they were well built, not like things you buy today. But faucets were old. The lock, knobs and the locks and the doors were old compared to what we have today. Skeleton keys, you know. Some play, houses still have them. But we used to think, and we, we thought, man, it's time for a change. They can have all this new stuff. But to them, it worked, and everything was fine. Not realizing, but spiritually in our lives, I think we get to the same places in our lives. We get to that thing where, well, it worked before, and I'm fine. I don't need to grow. I don't need to be changed in any way. And we, after a while, we begin to just accept the things the way that they are. We can begin to allow things to enter into our lives that are not pleasing to God. We begin to accept certain things in life. So, well, this that's all right. I can't see no harm in that. And we begin to allow these things just to overtake our lives. And soon Satan has found a way to code us and to keep us away from experiencing God the way that we should be experiencing God. Sometimes we need to look, step back and look outside the box of our lives and say, wow, I didn't realize I looked like that. And I'm not talking about physical looks. I'm talking about spiritually. Wow, 
Am I really, ask yourself questions. Am I really serving God the way that I should? Everything that I'm doing right now through this week or this last week, would, it be, would God be pleased with me? Am I striving to draw closer to God? Am I striving to allow, to have, to be, in my, my spirit to be a place where God can dwell within me? For many, there have been times, like I said, that we've turned we haven't turned with, away from God and, and are not in the place that we really should be. And the other reason I keep bringing this up is because it's so, so important that we don't get to heaven one day or when God calls his people home or we get there and God says, I never knew you. I didn't, I didn't know you because you, you, you allowed all these things into your life that were against me, the things that I did not want you to partake of. Things I, I warned you about. Things I told you not to be a part of. God wants it for all of us to be saved. And he has a higher calling for each and every one of us. The question is, are we living up to those standards today? Can God dwell within you today? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, Lord. We thank you for every part of it. And Lord, we realize that the only way that we're going to get to draw closer to understand your word is if you dwell with us, if you're a part of us. And today, Lord, I pray that you are a part of each person that's here. For that, Lord, that, you, that you are, your Holy Spirit is just covering them from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet, that they feel your Holy Spirit move within their lives. As they worship you, Lord, I pray today that we feel your Holy Spirit within us. That we come, we have gathered in your house to come to lift up your name on high, to worship you, to thank you, for Lord, for all the good things that you have given to us. And to realize, Lord, that so often, it's so easy for the things of this world to entwine with us, Lord. But Lord, if we stay focused upon you, that you will lift us up and place us upon higher ground. Lord, that you will set us apart from the things of this world. That you will protect us and walk with us and strengthen us. And I pray, Lord, that you will do that for each of us. Lord, we realize that we need that in our lives. Today, I ask, Lord, that you would stir us as a people, not to be satisfied with where we are in our spiritual walk, that we would get a longing and a hunger and a thirsting for you like we have never had one before, that we're just not satisfied, Lord, that we realize that, in, that each and every one of us, that we, that we are to be a dwelling place for you, that our spiritual lives need to be presented to you as a holy and sacred. And we thank you for that, Lord, that you have called us and that you have a purpose and a plan for each and every one of us. We ask your blessings today on each person in Jesus' name. Amen.